Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Sarah Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the American Economic Liberties Project. For those of you not familiar with us, we're an organization that's devoted to pushing government to confront corporate monopolies, which are now systemic features of our economy, and to decentralize and democratize economic power. Today's conversation will center around what we've called a tale of two bailouts, a close look at the way that policies and institutions have been structured to accelerate concentrations of corporate power in the wake of COVID-19. As millions and millions of people lost their jobs, the Federal Reserve was able to quickly support Wall Street and large corporations, while smaller businesses have been forced to navigate an atrophied small business administration, itself reliant on a consolidated banking sector to move capital. And I think today on Juneteenth, it's important to acknowledge that another unjust dichotomy is apparent in the government's response to COVID-19, which is that Black-owned businesses have been disproportionately unable to access support through federal programs and are shuttering at much, much higher rates than white-owned businesses. So what we're seeing now is a soaring stock market bolstered by the Fed's commitment to buying corporate debt, while smaller businesses remain in a state of acute precarity, especially those owned by people of color. And on the other side of this crisis, an economy that is looking like it will be even more concentrated and more stratified than before. Uh, we're grateful to have Congresswoman Katie Porter joining us shortly this afternoon to talk through these dynamics with us. In her short time in Congress, Representative Porter has proven uh, completely unafraid to confront powerful CEOs and fight for economic justice for everyday families. For anyone out there who might not know, prior to being elected to Congress, she also served as California's independent monitor for banks, overseeing banks' implementation of the mortgage settlement in the wake of the last financial crisis. Um, first, uh, Congressman Porter will be joining us shortly, and then we will have an opportunity to ask some questions. So I'm sure folks know by now how to pop questions in the chat. And then after that, we're going to turn to our panel, which I'm really excited um, is joining us today. That will be led by Graham Steele, who's the Director of Corporations and Society Initiative at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, he, he's joined by former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Sarah Bloom Raskin, also former Governor of the Federal Reserve Board, um, as well as Professor Marissa Barajaran at UC Irvine, and Sam Long, who's in a small business investor based out of Boston, all to talk about how the federal response to the coronavirus uh, crisis is structured differently, both in terms of policy and in terms of the way that our institutions uh, are actually designed to drive this dichotomy that furthers corporate concentration. So the Congresswoman should be joining us very shortly. Um, I'm gonna give folks a little bit of time to put any questions uh, in the chat and uh, we will go from there. I think what we I think what we might do is actually pivot to start with our panel, if that's all right uh, with folks and they're ready to go. And then when the congressman joins us, uh, we can uh, spend a little bit of time talking with her and then pivot back to the panel. Does that work to, for all of you? I think she's running a little bit behind today. Yeah. Sure. Great. So uh, thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, for joining the conversation today. Um, and to our amazing panelists and to American Economic Liberties Project for organizing this event. So as Sarah pointed out, 
it's important to start by acknowledging it's Juneteenth, our nation's true Independence Day. On June 19th, 1865, slaves in the westernmost Confederate state of Texas were finally notified that they were free. That was more than two years after the Emancipation Proclamation and two months after the Confederate Army surrendered. In his famous speech, Frederick Douglass said, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. And so it feels like each passing day, another example of gross injustice and cruelty is brought into the national spotlight. A pandemic that falls the hardest on black and brown communities, violence by the police against black and brown people, black and brown communities being shut out of the banking system, and on and on. An important point that I hope we drive home today is that government policy has a huge role to play in addressing racial, economic, and other forms of inequality. Today, we're gonna to talk about how a specific government program, the response to the current crisis, is addressing these problems or falling short and what more needs to be done. I'll introduce each one of our three esteemed panelists. I'll make a few remarks and then I'll ask them some questions that hopefully spark a lively conversation between them. If we have time, we'll incorporate audience questions as well. So first up is the Honorable Sarah Bloom Raskin, just one of the most accomplished public servants that I've ever encountered. She's a former banking committee staffer, the Maryland Banking Commissioner, a Federal Reserve Governor, and the Deputy Treasury Secretary. To get a sense of her priorities and her connection with the everyday experiences of people, I believe she's the first Fed Governor to ever secretly attend a job fair. She has been outspoken in the current moment about the need for the rescue to work for all people, not just the wealthy and corporations. Professor Marissa Baradaran of the UC Irvine Law School is nothing less than one of the most influential thinkers and scholars on the issue of the racial wealth gap and how our banking system can be a tool of either equity or inequality. Her two books, How the Other Half Banks and the Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap, both essential reading to understand the history of economic marginali marginalization in this country, as well as prescient guides for what to do about it. And finally, Sam Long is one of our nation's foremost experts on small business investment. He's a vice president with Pacific Lake Partners, a search fund investing firm based in Boston, and a board, a board observer at several companies. He's a graduate of Harvard Business, Business School, University of Cambridge, and the US Naval Academy. I highly recommend his article on financialization in the journal American Affairs. It's a lucid exposition of the role of finance in society's problems and the roots of business education in promoting the model of big finance. So should I turn it over now to Secretary Raskin? Okay, great. Well, thank you, Graham, for that lively introduction. I'm happy to be joining MRSA and Sam uh, for what I think is going to be a very interesting set of discussions. And thank you also to Sarah Miller and the American Economic Liberties Project for really articulating so, uh, so succinctly in today's event, uh, Tale of Two Bailouts, what is occurring and why it matters. So um, we are nearly halfway through the year 2020 and um, realize that um, when we look back just at January 2020, the beginning of the year, it looks like it is another planet. Um, we have seen in 2020 um, more um, death, more um, economic policy, um, more social upheaval than really any other time in modern history. The pandemic with its untold death and grief and anxiety, combined with the economic upheaval, which has produced more job losses than ever contemplated, um, and combined with really the killing of George Floyd and other targets of anti-Black black racism, have created together a significantly recontextualized environment. And to see the emergence of this recontextualized economic and social environment is really quite promising. So what we are observing and what this means really is that Americans are seeing in this moment new relationships that were always there 
but now appear vivid. They see, for example, relationships between anti-Black racism and durable economic progress. They see relationships between public health preparedness and financial stability. They see relationships um, between income inequality and anti-Black racism and economic progress that is durable. So there are these relationships that are now vivid, fully on display. And I think that in these relationships, we're going to start finding solutions. So let's drill down into the economic response in particular to the pandemic. And, and I'll give a short chronology as to how we got here, and then we'll, we'll branch off and talk about uh, how the response has really produced different tracks of a recovery. So a short chronology just to bring everybody up to date as to where we are. You'll recall we had a health crisis and a pandemic warning that was initially ignored. The federal government didn't act early enough to really contain it. And when there was no way or plan to, can, can, to contain it, the economy became the, the, the line of defense. So we were all under stay at home orders, the economy shut down, everything was essentially um, ordered shut and people were um, staying home from work. Um, except for essential and frontline workers. So the economy came to a virtual standstill. This meant that as businesses shut down, revenues plummeted and layoffs began because of course business owners did not have the wherewithal given that revenues were flat to be making the payments they needed to um, pay their workers. So we are in the midst of a health crisis and an economic recession simultaneously. And when that first became apparent, uh, Congress was called on to act, the Treasury was called on to act, the Federal Reserve was called on to act. And so what we got from that economic set of players, policymakers, we got a fiscal response from Congress, we got a monetary policy response from the Fed, and we got what I would say was a mixed fiscal and monetary policy response through something called 13.3. And I'll talk about that. So we had these three, if you think about the economic response, think about it in, in primarily the federal response, three buckets, okay? The fiscal response was um, the CARES Act, several CARES Acts, uh, where Congress appropriated um, a lot, an unprecedented amount of money to engage in targeted assistance, okay? Um, some of the features of that CARES Act, you are now all well versed in, um, but I wanna mention three of them, three aspects of them, and, and tell you that there were friction points, there were hiccups in getting this money of targeted assistance out the door. This was the CARES Act, you saw many features to it, but three features in particular that would have made a difference had they been implemented more smoothly are the PPP, which everybody at this point knows, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, the unemployment insurance um, uh, uh, enhancements, and direct cash payments, okay? Each of those were intended to actually provide businesses in the, in the case of the PPP and households in the case of UI and direct cash payments, a buffer to hold them to a point in time where they would be able to, the theory went, um, stay solvent. They wouldn't sink because they were essentially out of work. The PPP was intended to go to small businesses. It was tied to a condition that the businesses hang on to their employees um, if they wanted this PPP loan to become a grant. Uh, we know several, several uh, headaches with this. The PPP was implemented through the Small Business Administration, which was not ready for the onslaught of businesses to apply and essentially crumbled under the weight. Unemployment insurance. The idea here was to broaden the number of people who could be eligible to include independent contractors, to include self-employed people, even people who were part-time and had had their hours reduced even further. So the idea was to, um, to, to pay people 
to stay home during this health crisis. So UI was implemented. Well, UI, it turns out, is implemented through the 50 states. Some states are better than others in getting this money out the door because some states have made the investment that they need to keep their systems up to date and others don't. So significant hiccups on the UI side. And then the direct cash payments. The direct cash payments, you know, again, should have been a no brainer. All it entails is, is, is sending checks and they were primarily checks for $1,200 and getting them out the door. Significant problems there. Um, you might recall that these cash payments went out without some required flags on them that would have precluded the collection by debt collectors, the interceding by debt collectors into the payment stream and um, reducing the amount that was truly going to be available and accessible by the ultimate household, the ultimate individual. So on the congressional side, we saw on the fiscal side, the execution of the congressional intent, significant, significant bumps in the road. On the other hand, you had the monetary policy response. The monetary policy response really went quite smoothly. Part of the reason for that is that um, the Fed had already, prior to the pandemic, had been pretty much reduced to, a, had a very low runway in terms of using its traditional tool, the Fed funds rate, and instead had to immediately, at the beginning of the response to the pandemic, open all the doors, open the floodgates, let every imaginable tool um, start to do its thing. So the Fed immediately, you'll remember these series of Sunday nights where the Fed sort of gathered up their different tools and lobbed them over into markets very quickly. Reduction of the Fed funds rate to zero. So putting the Fed funds rate to the zero lower bound, starting quantitative easing again um, without limit, uh, without an end date, without a quantity, extending the extending the type of securities that the quantitative easing program would start to pursue. And this all happened extraordinarily quickly. Um, markets started to react, okay. However, it was really this, comp the 13-3 facilities, the response that was a mixture of fiscal and monetary, where you started to see um, the markets really begin to rally. And, and this is what those 13-3 facilities look like. Essentially, they, this is um, money that Congress appropriated for Treasury to backstop the creation of certain facilities that the Fed would put in place uh, during the course of the pandemic to assist particular parts of the economy. So for example, we have, uh, we've seen uh, 13 three lending facilities set up to purchase corporate ETFs. We've seen a corp, we've seen a, a 13 three facility set up to buy new issuances of corporate debt. We've seen one set up called the Main Street Lending Facility. That one's supposed to lend into Main Street. We've seen one set up to purchase municipal debt. That one is also part of this uh, part of this corral of responses. Those facilities, some of which took a while to, to, to stand up, others stood up pretty immediately, set the tone for a set of responses by the Fed that essentially raised asset values. So we saw in um, the announcement of these 13-3 facilities a buoyancy to the market. Um, really a buoyancy, by the way, that was disconnected <laughs> to fundamentals in a, lot of, in a lot of cases, because of course the pandemic hadn't gone away. The death toll continued to rise. There, is, there was no vaccine um, on the horizon. So people were you know, essentially seeing a market recovery that was far ahead of anything really happening on the ground. And of course, uh, no budging at all to the um, unemployment numbers. So, um, you know, so I want to turn to our other <laughs> panelists, but let me, you know, just close by saying that um, the assistance has not been getting to where it is most needed. Um, the Fed's assistance has been targeted through the banking sector and through markets. That yet, if ever, will be felt at the level of, um, of, of households. 
of small businesses, of um, people who are essentially um, attempting to pay their utility bills, pay their rent, and um, move forward. Um, another thing to keep in mind that I think is of particular interest to listeners here is that um, the Fed is really propping up markets right now. And by propping up markets, they are assisting asset holders. Um, that is the category of people that are, um, that are, being, are being helped. Um, unfortunately, this also has a distorting effect. There is a distortion of competition that comes when you promote a rally that is detached from fundamentals. Um, Robin, I don't know if you're there. There is a chart here that actually looks at this notion of sort of zombie companies. You can see there are more shares of companies where their debt servicing costs are higher than profits, right? And that is a proxy for what is, you know, what is a zombie firm? It is a, a firm where your debt is so much, uh, so much heavier than what your profit uh, is. And you can see that just taking off here. Um, I leave it to, 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 to listeners, to people um, in, this, in this group as to whether or not we, we want an economy with such a high share of zombie firms and what essentially that might mean uh, for our economy going forward. And I will stop there. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Secretary Raskin. And I see the Congresswoman is here now, so why don't I kick it back over to Sarah and the Congresswoman and they can have their conversation and then we'll come back to Professor Bharadaran and Sam, and then we'll do the Q and A. I think thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Congresswoman Porter, for joining us. Uh, you know, we we are really wanting to kind of grapple with what has come to play here and the the kind of stratification in the response to this crisis, as represented by the Fed and the access of large corporations and Wall Street firms to support compared to smaller businesses, and then an additional, uh, um, yeah, an additional kind of inequity in the in how uh, people of color are able to access capital for small businesses, small business owners. So, I'd love to kind of turn it over to you for a few minutes to give us your thoughts uh, from your perch in Congress and your role, um, kind of overseeing uh, the response to this crisis and how we should be thinking about policy going forward. Uh, given how it's kind of starting to play out in really significant ways. Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me, and I apologize so much for being late. Uh, my staffer just said, don't worry, it happens, and I said, not to me. Um, so I apologize so much. Um, I think this is the first time I have like let something go by, but I was doing an event um, and was having fun doing it and, and let time go by. So I was going to be on time at 10.30. Um, so I appreciate everybody um, accommodating me and it was great to be able to listen um, to Sarah um, and hear her perspective on this. And this is just a tremendous um, group of people that we've assembled here. Um, Graham as well, um, Sam, Marissa. These are people that I follow on Twitter that I listen to, that I call um, when I need advice and insight um, on these very issues. And I want to highlight something that um, I think builds on what Sarah was saying and I think is going to continue to be a theme throughout this panel, which is that Congress, where it looked like Congress was acting kind of with similar speed in terms of small business relief and Main Street relief and large business relief, um, in terms of both of those being incorporated into the CARES Act, that's not how it has flowed out. So that the 13-3 program, um, some of that began, the monetary part of that began working very quickly. Um, the reaction to markets, whenever there's a market problem, the Fed is somehow able to miraculously act um, within hours, within days. Days is long um, when it's the market at risk, but when it's people at risk, when it's people facing foreclosure, when it's people at risk of going hungry, there's always a lot of, well, we have to get it right and we have to design this program and it's still gonna take time. So we saw this exact dynamic in 2008, um, in 2009, 2010, where we were able to overnight create these facilities to help prop up the market and prop up um, actors, some of them have been part of the problem, 
but the foreclosure prevention programs took years and years and years. So programs like HAMP and HARP and Making Homes Affordable, that umbrella that were set up in 2010, still weren't working real well in 2011 and even 2012. So there's some of that same um, issue here and sort of, it looks like when Congress passes these things because there's help for small business or there's help for, Main, um, for Wall Street in the same bill, that everybody's getting help at the same time, but that's not how it plays out. Um, I also want to emphasize the sort of oversight problems that we're seeing. Um, and we have a big oversight gap between um, small business and large business, or between household economics and between um, Wall Street or large corporate companies, corporate bond programs. So we've all heard the stories about there being some lending issues with um, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, you can all name, you know, the Steak Shack and the Roos Chris, and, but we have no real insight just to who may have been taking advantage of the 13-3 program um, that Sarah mentioned um, and whether they're you what they're doing with the money. So we don't have nearly as good of oversight and as nearly checks and balance, there aren't as many checks in that program um, as there are supposed to be. So we have oversight problems at both the Paycheck Protection Program small business level and also at the level of our largest businesses. So we've been working in our office to try to get answers to these things. Um, it's really important to demonstrate that the Paycheck Protection Program is working, if in fact it is, um, and to understand where it's not working. Um, but it's also equally important not to allow the Federal Reserve to hide behind any kind of cloak here about, you know, we can't answer those questions, that would somehow be market distorting. Um, these are taxpayer dollars being put at risk at Treasury, and we need to have answers for it. So it's been more than a month since I wrote to Secretary Mnuchin um, and Chairman Powell asking for answers about um, the $500 billion, the half a trillion dollars that Congress um, allocated. And while we have seen, as Sarah mentioned, um, buying of corporate ETFs, um, buying of new bonds, in some cases, I think they're buying existing bonds, which doesn't really make any sense to me, um, to be perfectly frank. That's not about stabilizing the market going forward. That's about shoring up asset values for people who took a risk long before this pandemic was on the radar. Um, but there's also been a real question about, you, you said you needed this half a trillion dollars and we gave it to you in Congress. And we can do a lot to help families with half a trillion dollars, a lot to address the real pinch points of student loans, of the cost of education, of um, stimulus or economic payments to help families make ends meet with half a trillion dollars. We gave it to the Fed and, and to Treasury, we gave it to Treasury to backstop these Fed lending facilities, but a lot of that money's gone unused now 10 weeks, 12 weeks into this crisis. Um, and you know, just later this, earlier this week, we saw sort of two, uh, last week we saw sort of two things happen on almost the exact same day. Um, we saw the stock market erase the losses of the pandemic. At the exact same time that we saw the National Bureau of Economic Research announce our first recession in a decade. And that recession is not being felt by the folks that Sarah gently calls asset holders. Um, as an elected official, I call them wealthy people. Um, and so these are, the, these are the folks who have the, who have retirement accounts, who have investments. Um, and that's like half of all Americans or less. So the, the huge swath, half of America, isn't getting any bump off the stock market going up, um, isn't getting any bump off these corporate, buying, corporate bond buying programs. Um, and instead, they're really struggling with problems like rent, um, with problems like unemployment insurance. Um, and so I think there needs to be a lot more willingness to, to connect these two things and look at them as the trade-offs that they are, rather than treating them as two silos and the Fed get, and the Treasury gets what it wants and then we give this to small business and then we give this to the consumers. These are interlacing choices that we made. Um, and we could think about if the Federal Reserve and Treasury, if they're not going to make loans out of the Main Street lending program 12 weeks later, I guess what I'm taking from that is that we don't need that program. Um, and that money needs to be allocated at the household level where we have 16% unemployment and we have a lot of people facing extra expenses. If that's not the case and there is a need to continue to have this appropriation to Treasury to backstop the Fed, 
that I would like some answers from Secretary Mnuchin and from Chairman Powell about that. Um, what is the cause of the delay? What are they doing? The last thing I'll close with is, and looking back to where I started about kind of the PPP and transparency and all the news stories about who got a PP loan, who didn't get a PPP loan, we're not having that same level of scrutiny about what's going on at the Wall Street level, about whose corporate bonds are getting bought and whose aren't, about who the advisors are who are doing the advising. Um, you know, some of these companies that are advising the Treasury and Fed also market and, and operate these funds, these exchange traded funds, these ETFs and other things. So we need to make sure that this transparency is happening and we need it to be happening in real time. I have to say, I think one of the most depressing things is when we learn a year later that there were problems. Um, we know there are problems right now in these programs and the time for answers was yesterday. Um, and having not gotten answers yesterday, then I expect them today. And I'm going to keep waking up each morning with that expectation and continue to be pushing forward. Because if we don't get the answers, we can't reallocate this money. We can't make changes to the programs um, to make them actually effective. And so taxpayers have every right to expect us to be able to answer questions like, where is that half a trillion dollars going? Who is benefiting? Who is profiting? And how, if I'm a typical American with no assets, no stock market holdings, no retirement account, and I'm unemployed, how is the stock market going up helping me? And there are some things and people on this call can help understand and explain that to people, but we in Congress as elected officials need to be able to answer those questions to our constituents who are struggling to make ends meet. So I'm really um, excited about the, the, this panel. I think the title of this event, um, A Tale of Two Bailouts, is really, really important. But what made me kind of sad when I saw the title was I've seen this movie. I saw the tale of two bailouts in, 20, in 2009 and 2010, and I didn't like how it ended. And here we are again with another tale of two bailouts. So what have we learned from 2008 and 2009 and 2010 that we can apply to today? And look, we saw the Fed act quickly then. We're seeing the Fed and Treasury act quickly now. We saw families and households and workers have to wait and wait and wait. And by the time we got help to them, a lot of the most vulnerable had already been irreparably harmed. And that's where I fear we're going again this time. So I'm gonna to continue to push on these issues um, and I'm gonna stay on this panel until my next event at 11 so I can keep listening and learning. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Um, and again, apologies if, uh, for being late. Um, if I'm ever late, you can just send Marissa. She's a fellow UCI uh, professor. She's a neighbor. Come knock on my door um, because I would love to um, get on and, and be part of it. So thank you so much, Sarah. I'll turn it back over to the next panelist. Thanks so much. Uh, Marissa, do you want to jump in there? It might be a good time for you to follow on. <laughs> Unmute. Yes, do you hear me? Great. Hi, Katie. Um, it's so it's so wonderful to be on this panel, and I'll be very quick here um, because there's so much to discuss, and hopefully we can have this um, engagement. But you know, um, what what I, I just want to I mean, sorry, rep Representative Porter. Um, I I want to highlight what um, and she's my representative. So um, uh, what Representative Porter um, said, you know, about about um, the abstraction, sort of, or, or that's my word. But the way you know, I mean, the way I see it, it the latter of sort of where you fall in the economy, um, money seems to get way more abstract the higher you are. So if you're a bank and you get trillions of dollars of stimulus funds, that's an abstract sort of balance sheet item versus if you're down here where a lot of normal people live, the majority of, of people, you know, $100 could mean the difference between eviction and having a home that is safe for your children um, to stay in. And so, so that's where when we talk about bailouts and funds being, you know, sort of um, uh, called out overnight, um, and, and going to the top and not really trickling down, and we all know this, we all saw this story um, last time, is, is the, the actual tangible effect. So um, last week and for several weeks, hundreds of people have been waiting at a single ATM in New York City for their unemployment check 
Um, and coming in from the five boroughs, waiting three hours in line, mostly people of color, um, to save a three to five dollar fee. And you had this, you know, the, uh, the reporters um, talked to this guy who biked in from Queens, uh, who's a line worker, and you know, three dollars is a meal for that person. And and the fact that we don't have a branch in Queens where someone can just go pick up their ATM fee without uh, or their their um, unemployment uh, check without a fee is something that is really um, important to consider when we talk about these two bailouts. Um, the other is, uh, you know, the, the black and brown businesses, like you said, in the PPP loans, um, most of them didn't apply, but those who did only um, one in 10, I think, got um, a bailout according to the Color of Change, which is an organization that did surveys. Um, very few were even well capitalized enough to go um, to the PPP um, program, but those who did were not given um, funds. And part of it is because we go through banks. So both of these problems, the idea that you're paying a significant portion of your the, the wages that you need for food and rent to you know fees or trying to avoid that, one. And two, um, the fact that a lot of the, the businesses that are most vulnerable um, especially as this pandemic hit black and brown communities the hardest, aren't able to get these loans because they don't have the relationships with these banks. They don't have the capital. They're not um, big money um, places for banks. So I actually want to back out just a little bit now because it is Juneteenth and, and to talk about generally um, what we talk about when we talk about racial wealth gap um, and, and how that affects community. So today, black families, and maybe you know these statistics, but just, I mean, I, I don't think you can say them too many times. Um, a, a white families have 13 times more wealth than black families. So uh, a third of black families have zero to negative wealth. Um, the average black uh, family has 11,000 compared to 141,000 in wealth for white families. That's from Pew. Um, and the perpetuation of poverty is sort of stunning. Right? So 75% of black children who grew up in families in the bottom wealth category remain in that same category as adults. Um, so that is a ladder, uh, the American dream ladder that is broken um, for uh, a, a lot of communities. Um, and uh, uh, even, even when it comes to income, a, a study found that for um, white families, every additional dollar they earn leads to $5 in wealth. For black families, each dollar creates only 69 cents in total wealth. So income isn't something that's going to fix that. And part of this, this thing is it's, it's segregation, it's structural, it has to do with equity and housing and who got you know, government stimulus funds. In the last time we did a bailout, way back during the New Deal. Um, so, so I actually think, you know, if we're going to go to 2008, we might as well go to the New Deal because that bailout also left out um, Black communities in a significant way that we're still affecting. Uh, we're, still, well, we're still seeing the effects of now, and we're seeing it in very sort of uh, all over uh, the place. So one is how, how rapidly uh, COVID sort of, you know, the, the, the dis disparate effects um, came out. And the other is, you know, um, George Floyd, um, the, the um, murder of George Floyd happened in Chicago Avenue and 38th Street in South Minneapolis. And I sort of, you can, you can do this online and go to the mapping inequality, um, uh, New Deal era maps. And if you look at the 1934 map for that neighborhood, it is a red line neighborhood. It was a black neighborhood. And what you know, that block, because there were, it says, and I have the exact quotes, it was called de-hazardous uh, because majority colored people, which meant blacks, and poor Jews, right? Um, so that's, so they said, you know, you may not lend a mortgage there. And then so you bring, you bring those, those um, things out to now and you see how we, we just haven't fixed these um, endemic problems. And every time, time we have a bailout, um, every time we have a crisis, it pulls further. And then when we have a bailout, um, unless you target it to those communities, you end up having these um, these disparate effects. And so I I will again because it's it's a historic day. Um, I want to sort of I'll just close off uh, to the to allow us for more conversation. Um, but you know when we talk about Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" speech, the part uh, we sometimes leave out is that he framed the Black American claim to justice as rooted in a broken promise. Right. So he says America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring their sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, which has come back marked insufficient funds. He says, we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of um, justice. Um, so, you know, I think um, that that is a, a check that is still um, sort of defaulted. And I think for this crowd, the language of, of that uh, banking um, scenario uh, is hopefully resonant. So. That's it. That was great. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, Sam, do you want to take a few minutes? Or Graham, can you hear me? Okay, good. 
Yeah, thank you. And, and it, I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be on the same screen with, with so many talented and accomplished folks. And, and thank you to Sarah for inviting me. Uh, Sarah suggested that I, that I walk through quickly a, a, a piece that a colleague and I, a former colleague and I wrote in the journal um, in May where we asserted that the, the Fed's intervention in the credit markets really are going to amount to three wealth transfers. And the first is from the middle and the working class to the affluent, uh, you know, as Secretary Raskin pointed out. The second from the prudent to the more aggressive. And three, you know, a generational transfer. So, you know, one that I've, you know, sort of slyly named from the Zoomers to the Boomers. Uh, and, you know, I think it's clear that the Fed's interventions in the markets prevented a lot of bankruptcies. Um, certainly to the extent that this has been explained to the American people, the people you know, responsible at the Fed and at Treasury seem heavily reliant on a line of reasoning that this was done to protect jobs. And there's a big difference between a bankruptcy of a small business and a bankruptcy of a highly levered publicly traded corporation. I think this we all know. Um, you know when a big company goes bankrupt, its investors are wiped out or take a haircut, the capital structures reorganized, generally employees keep running the business. And that's definitely not the case in a small company. When small businesses fail, you know, job losses ensue. And so in keeping these large companies out of bankruptcy in the way that it did, the Fed saved equity holders. I think we're all on the same page about that. When you realize that 88% of the equities in this country are owned by the top 10% of the income distribution, you realize that the job saving rhetoric around the credit market intervention may have actually been top cover for protecting the net worth of the economy's wealthiest participants. And to do that, you know, you need to print money, you need to lower interest rates, and this ends up hammering the middle class and hammering the working class. There was a time, I'm told, uh, it's never happened during my adulthood, that a savings account could yield a decent risk adjusted return. That's definitely not the case any longer. Um, so, so that's really the first wealth transfer, you know, from the impairment of middle and working class savings to the benefit of the rich. And I'm with Congressman Porter there. We, we might as well, you know, call a spade a spade. There's, a, there's a, a growing perception, I mean, even among the investor class, that American capitalism is becoming an exclusive members-only casino for those with enough wealth to take risk. And when you gamble and win, you profit. And when you lose, you're made whole with money printed by a central bank. So companies that borrow for share buybacks and, and people who buy complex derivatives, they took risks. And that should have resulted in pain for investors this spring, but it didn't because the Fed stepped in. And I think that's effectively a second transfer you know, from the economy's most cautious or most prudent participants to its most aggressive. And so I think that the third transfer, the generational one, is the fuzziest for people to contemplate, there's no way around the fact that there's going to be a price tag for all of this. And, and what we've done uh, is made it really hard to go after some of the priorities for the next decade, some of the things that, that Mercer talked about, you know, healthcare reform, education reform, infrastructure, all of those things are going to be much harder to pursue given the price tag of, of um, this spring's events. Uh, and, and that's top of mind for me, not just because of my age, but because I spend a lot of time working with young entrepreneurs. I, I, my day job, I, I work with people in their early to mid thirties, people who are looking to buy and grow small businesses. And they're often buying businesses from people who are their parents' age. And so I have this vantage point for how some of the most accomplished young people in business are interacting with the, with the small business economy. And while we do have a dynamic small business economy that we should be proud of, it's a far cry from what it used to be. In the mid 1970s, roughly one in seven businesses in America were less than a year old. Today, that's one in 17. And this is despite the fact that if you read the business press, it seems like there are startups being founded on just about every street corner in America. In fact, it's actually much, much harder to start a business in the United States today than it was 30 or 40 years ago. And so one of the primary challenges of, for small business, you know, I, I think the, the pandemic, the silver lining here is that there's an opportunity to fix a lot of what's, what's broken about the small business landscape. And so those challenges are one, you know, something that's near and dear to Sarah Miller's heart, which is the concentration of economic power. It makes it extremely hard to start and grow a small business in this country. The lack of access to capital, 
for all businesses, but particularly you know, for those owned by black Americans and people of color is the capital landscape is barren. Um, and then third, the financialization of the economy. Uh, and, and that, you know, that kind of rears its head both in terms of capital and in terms of human capital. So I think, you know, for, for me, you know, as someone who's, who's not in government, who's, who's effectively on the sidelines, but is you know, involved in the economy, I, I'm looking forward to understand as we come out of the pandemic, what role does the government take, not just in applying a Band-Aid, but in, in rebuilding the small business economy, which used to be the backbone you know, of our society. Great. Um, thanks so much, Sam. Uh, so let's get to a few questions, I think, in a little bit with the, some of the remaining time that we have here. And I wonder if for all of our panelists, we could step back and I can ask you all a framing question, because I think that there's a lot of the debate about whether the bailouts are have been successful or not so far have sort of looked at it as a binary decision. And I think that this is very similar to the way that people debated what happened in 2008. And the, the counterfactual is, did we do doing something versus doing nothing? Um, and so I wonder um, if you all could sort of say, do you agree that that is an appropriate frame to think about um, the interventions that could have taken place here? Um, and then let me add an additional question on top of that, which is how many of the decisions about um, the CARES Act, but also all of the rescue programs in general, how many of those decisions do you think were inevitable because of, for example, the way the law is structured uh, versus discretionary choices by the entities like the Fed and Treasury about how to structure some of these programs to uh, you know, either in a, in a broad conceptual way or the way that they want to deliver or target the relief. So I don't know if the secretary wants to start first and we'll sort of go down the line. Sure, so it's a great question um, and it's got a pretty simple answer. Uh, it's not, it should not have been an on off switch or a binary choice at all. There is a lot of discretion here. There is a lot of choice regarding how, these, how this response was going to look. Um, and even, you know, it's, it's interesting, and Sam, I, I, I really appreciate your framing of the, the, the different transfers that have gone on, and you talk about, okay, but what do we, let's move on. How do we, what is the role of government after the pandemic? I want to know, what is the role of government now? We are still in the midst of this now, and there are choices being made now, both on the Treasury side and on the, on the Fed side, that, that have an impact. For example, the money that Congresswoman Porter was talking about that Congress appropriated to these 13-3 facilities, right, to be the Treasury backstop. Well, who gets to decide how that money gets allocated among the various lending facilities? Who gets to decide what those facilities look like? Who gets to, to decide what the, what the conditions are for getting access to that funding? That, that all gets to be decided by the Fed and presumably by Treasury. And yet we are all in this mode of thinking, okay, well, we're just going to accept whatever comes, you know, whatever, however they craft it is going to be what we're going to accept. It doesn't need to be like that. There is discretion here that is being exercised. And I think we need to understand the contours of the reasons for these decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, my comment was going to be along exactly the lines um, of uh, what, Sarah, what Sarah said. And, and that is, um, or maybe, maybe let me say in a different way, it was, we, we kind of assume that monetary policy is this technocratic fix, right? You just have to plug in the numbers. And this is very much an Alan Greenspan era ideology, but it has always been an ideology. And, and, and I think we, we, the, the, the problem with this ideology is that it looks like just a technical decision to you know, mess with interest rates, to push on inflation, to send the money um, you know, to repo markets or commercial paper or um, you know, to QE. And, and these things end up having vast distributional consequences. So when you choose to you know, save the asset-backed securities versus the actual assets, which are the homes, that has distributional effects. I mean, again, back to the racial wealth gap, black families lost 53% of their wealth during the subprime crisis, have not recovered. And, you know, banks obviously recovered quite rapidly and, uh, you know, are booming or were um, until recently, but I think they'll be fine. Um, but I think it's also about the buttons that you have to push. And I think the the Fed has had these monetary buttons that they 
honed and, and, and did really well during the 2008 um, crisis that they just, I mean, over a weekend, you saw the Fed use all of the tools that they developed from 2008 to 2009. They're like, okay, we've got repo, we've got this, we've got that. And I don't think we have a structure to do that button to send families $1,200 as these lines show, um, you know, the ATMs or to save homeowners. And one of the things, you know, the Treasury Secretary Geithner said during, you know, the discussion of HAMP, which some of you, all of you probably remember was the, the, the homeowner um, uh, saving thing. He was just like, you know, it's very complicated. We just, there's, you know, moral hazard and all of these issues. And I think these things are, um, it's easier to do at the top. And, and that's part of the, the problem, but it's not law. Law is a framing structure. We can change law. We change law all the time. 13.3 is a very expansive legal code. Sam, before you uh, before you go, let me ask you an additional question here, which is, and I think I think the secretary and Professor Baradaran sort of touched on this, but the Fed kind of says or frames itself as not picking winners and losers, but maybe you can put a sort of a finer point on who, from your perspective, um, particularly in the small business marketplace, do you think that they are picking winners and losers with their choices, and and who's winning and who's losing from your perspective as an investor? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's, that's an easy thing to say, you know, and, and, and to hide, you know, to hide behind that statement. I think it's, it's sort of patently false kind of down the line, um, even when it's inadvertent. You know, I think in, in the small business landscape, you know, it, it's the, the, the troubles of small firms in accessing PPP, for example, are well documented. Um, the trouble, the troubles in, Navigating the process, you know, have been well documented. Um, and so, who's Graham to answer your specific question? Who's who's losing here? I think it's companies that are um, that don't have banking relationships. You know, like that is a major area of reform. And I think if you if you you know were in the were, if you were under the impression that there wasn't an underbanked class in this country before this 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 sort of this sort of, sort of ripped off the the bandaid of that um, that illusion. Um, and, and then, you know, certainly the demographic components of who's banked and who's not banked in this country are, are, are laid bare for all to see. I Thank think on, on so go ahead. Keep, no, keep going. You know, on, your, on your original question, I mean, like you wrote this spring, you know, like we don't have to pretend like credit markets have some sort of like laws of physics, I think was the word that you used a, a few months ago. And like, that, that's, that, that's certainly the case. I think that, um, the, the discourse should be that this is this was this is not binary. It, it didn't have to, you know, it, it didn't have to happen the way that it did. I also think that the, you know, on the flip side of that is that to be productive moving forward, we should have the discourse should also identify what worked um, and, and what was positive in this uh, and where are the areas for us to be able to build coming out of this. Great. Uh, I, I want to get back to some of that in a minute. Um, but next, I sort of want to ask you all, and maybe we'll start with Marissa next. Um, what, let's say we continue on the current trajectory of uh, the way we're doing the recovery policy. What is our economy going to look like coming out of this? Um, you know, just talk about the broad contours and the shape and where you sort of see both business going, but also the American household going after we come out of this on the, on the current path. Yeah, so there's, I think there's like a small technical um, or, or a fine grained one and then a big picture. I mean, the big picture is if you are well capitalized during this crisis, if you have money you're sitting on, if you're private equity, if you're a cash wealthy business or household, you're going to, you're going to be fine and you're going to be probably better off. Um, and part of the granulars, and then of course, those who were on the edge, I think will be pushed further down. Um, just, just because that's always how these things go, unless there's a dramatic policy response. But you know, if you look down at who, who is sitting on piles of cash and what happened last time? So looking at private equity and private equity the, through the Trump administration just got another $400 billion in, in um, 
pension funds and you know 401ks that now can go into private equity funds. So they're sitting on a lot of cash. And private equity is is great at disaster and 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 buying up these assets. So what you're going to see is a lot of you know small land uh, landlords, um, small business holders who won't be able to last. Right? They won't be as liquid long enough for this crisis to pass. This is if the, if it, it continues to last. Um, they lose, they get foreclosed on. Banks have all these foreclosed properties. What happened to foreclosed properties in 2008 is they were bought up by private equity firms. And that that is is sort of obvious because they're the only buyers in a market that is a, 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 um, down like that. And so you're going to see more of that being sucked up. And then, you know, uh, rent, rentals, um, so single family homes post 2008 were, you know, turned from homeowners to renters. That I, I think will happen again. A lot of the small businesses that were surviving until now will get bought by bigger businesses. So, you know, uh, back to the economic liberties project um, sort of mission of, of, of antitrust or anti-monopoly, I, you know, I think the way that these things go is big businesses and uh, large capital holders get bigger and, and their capital grows and the small get smaller um, and or, or die, right? Um, and, and you can see this even before 2008. Right? There's this famous Bank of America CEO quote that I love to quote in everything I write where, you know, Hugh McCall, who's the CEO of Bank Amer of America, he's just like, you're either growing or you're dying. Right. And he, of course, his bank was just sucking up all of the small banks that were dying between the 70s, 80s, 90s. And um, he was growing. And I think that's that's what happens. You're either growing or you're dying. So who's going to grow and who's going to die? Well, great. So, Sam, who's going to grow? Who's going to die? It's, it's certainly an interesting question. I mean, I think that, that you have the pandemic has has accelerated a tremendous amount of long-term trends in the economy um, and the businesses that will benefit from that are going to are going to be the businesses that were benefited from the long-term trends in the economy so you, what am i talking about i'm talking about trends in education trends in healthcare I and mean, i think telehealth is is something that i think we are all thinking about and is and is interesting and it's going to intersect with how the government involves itself in the economy over the next 10 years um, you know, you, like, like Marissa said, like the, the pools of capital and the access to that is, is going to be a significant factor over the next 10 years. And the, I, I don't see a scenario uh, w where without concerted effort, the economy just definancializes by itself. You know, I think that's something that we all should be thinking about is, 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 is how, how does that happen? And the other question I think that is, where the discourse is happening more on the right than on the left is, is the nation's industrial base. And the interplay there between that question and small business, I think is an important one for, for folks on both sides of the aisle to be talking about. Can I ask a quick Can we jump in? Yeah, of course. Secretary Raskin, uh, before we all kind of break, let's, let's say in six months, you're back at Treasury overseeing the Treasury Department. I wanna pivot a little bit I know. <laughs> I'm like, let's hope, happiness. Like, let, um, you know, I, I was a treasury during the last financial crisis and, you know, just talking about HAMP uh, and moral hazard uh, kind of makes me uh, twitch and is part of the reason why some of the folks in, on this team have come together, like working through the last financial crisis, seeing the impacts of that. And, you know, I think it's been a little bit of, are we really, you know, doing this, doing this again, right? When so many households had not recovered from the last crisis. Um, and I think also there, you know, it feels like uh, there is a, a transformation of consciousness hap happening in a variety of ways in this country around how, uh, what we wanna demand from our government and what economic and social justice looks like and all of these questions of who has power and who doesn't and how that power moves through society and commerce, you know, are, are are very present, uh, more you know, I think much more so than the last financial crisis, uh, and there feels like there there is a kind of deep urgency to do things very differently uh, in the way that government interacts with corporate power um, and structural inequality, and what the government does, and how it is shaped, and how institutions are organized, and you know, I think getting back to the beginning of uh, the origin, you know, this particular. Um, event, you know, we saw just how, how completely easy it was for large corporations and Wall Street to get whatever support they needed and how we'd really atrophied the SBA and 
you know, uh, uh, created a system that was reliant on private banks and then that built an inequity, you know, so like, it feels like there that we need serious, uh, significant change. There is a transformation in consciousness happening, you know, in our work on corporate power and big tech, there is like real momentum for structural solutions there that are bipartisan. And I think shocking and somewhat inspiring if you just rewind from two years ago to see kind of what a crazy notion, you know, breaking up a Facebook or a Google might be And here. We're kind of poised to see uh, the first antitrust suits in uh, 20 years. So I want to just ask you, Secretary Raskin, if you are sitting uh, in the, I think if I remember the fourth floor corner office, how would you think about governing? How do you think about your role um, from Treasury in, in shaping the economy in a way that can help to push back against some of these, you know, just really, you know, tragic and um, troubling uh, trajectories? Yeah, well, that's, I think, just, you know, sort of beautifully re recapped, Sarah, and I think you, um, you know, you understand really what is at stake here, it, what's, what's at stake here, and I like your, um, you know, your references to, you know, a, 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 a transformation of consciousness, um, a deep urgency. I think, I think, um, uh, we are in a recontextualized environment. I mean, there is no question um, but that we are not going back to what things looked like pre-pandemic. Um, too much has happened and there's just too much, um, too much and, and positive consciousness as to what these relationships are that I think people maybe um, uh, uh, theoretically understood, but now they feel it. They understand, they understand these connections in ways that they um, really didn't have a vivid sense of before. And so I think, um, so I think that there is a, 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 a cry really for a new, a new set of um, arrangements, a way in which we can actually create a much more resilient, inclusive, uh, sustainable economy that is going to work for everybody. And frankly, it has to work for everybody. One thing that we are learning is that um, you can't have an economy that is that vibrant when you have haves and have nots. You really have to grow inclusively if you're, if you're gonna have any kind of um, hope of, 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 of being truly resilient. You can't do it without a middle class. I mean, it's, um, it's as, painful and as simple as that. So um, essentially, we need much more um, inclusive growth. And we also have to recognize that uh, the response here um, to this pandemic has been one that has um, left people with a real distaste for massive amounts of um, uh, interjection that don't get targeted to people that need it, to places, of, to parts of the economy that need it. People are seeing that in a way that they might have been slower to realize after the financial, the you know, the financial crisis, where homeowners were definitely put uh, second to the financial sector. Um, here, people are seeing um, that their health needs to be as important as their economic well-being, that uh, they cannot be um, systematically um, targeted by uh, institutional racism. They are demanding essentially a new, um, a new order. The good news in all of this, and I'll, I'll turn it then back to you and to Graham, the good news here is there are really a lot of good ideas hanging around. We have really, in the context of this discussion, but in the context of many discussions, heard from people who really have proposed solutions. That is something that is so instrumental. One of the, one of the things I've always thought about is when you have a crisis, um, you have to act so quickly that what you do is you just pick up the tools you have and you use what you have and you cross your fingers and you hope that you're going to get there with those tools. So what we've seen is that those tools are actually broken. 
they don't work well. They have been underinvested in. Some of them have just been, have, have been ignored for years. And sure enough, we get hit with a crisis and we are completely ill-prepared to actually deal with it in a way that will promote an, a durable, inclusive recovery. So one thing that we're going to need to do is to bring forward a lot of the bold ideas, uh, ideas that maybe once were considered bold, but now are gonna con be considered absolutely necessary and part of, a, um, part of a plan and a recovery that is going to reimagine really what, uh, what our society can be, what competition looks like, what the economy looks like, what well-being really consists of. So thank you. Yeah, I think we're seeing imaginations broadening, like in Washington at least. Um, you know, compared to five years ago or 10 years ago. And I think the moment demands that. So hopefully we have the opportunity to make some of those big, bold uh, structural changes. Marissa, do you want to, to, can I give you the last word before we wrap? Um, I, I think it's a shame to not give <laughs> Sarah the last word. I mean, I think I, I agree. And I think it's um, part of that path dependence has to be broken. Like she said, I mean, you need bold changes. Um, you need someone like Sarah at the, that fourth floor office, whatever it is, because I think one of the problems during the last um, uh, bailout was that it was the same people who kind of, you know, you, and you get this ideological sort of incestuous sort of, you know, thinking and, 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 and you don't have those new ideas. And I think what we need going forward is, okay, what those ideas let us hear. So we can't just keep recycling those. We need, we need some really new ways of thinking and, and kind of even going down to like fundamentals. Um, uh, and, and like she said, I mean, I really do hope it's someone um, like Sarah who, who thinks about that stuff this way, because if it's not, uh, there isn't, there isn't um, the, the paths that we have trod down, there's no uh, way that they're going to fix it. They, they haven't before. So that is it. Well, I want to keep going for like another hour, but I'm sure you all have things to do. Uh, we're really, really grateful um, that you could join us for this conversation. I think it's important. I think it's important to demystify the role of the Fed. It's important for um, a broader kind of cohort of advocates and people in policy to understand what it's doing and what impacts it has. Um, and so thank you all, Sam, Secretary Raskin, Marissa Graham, uh, for taking the time to be with us today. We'll talk to you soon.